Hi, this is Mark from uh, the Skywagons podcasts. We also do a Skywagon University uh, YouTube channel, which talks about different models and types and different planes. But um, it depends on the planes we get in as to what we do. But today, we've got Juan Brown here, the famous YouTuber who got me into all this. Thanks very much. Uh, we're just going to randomly talk about whatever comes up. So, Juan, welcome. Hey, thanks. So, uh, I've been very impressed with this new studio setup you got here. As a broker, what are you going to do for guests? I mean, you got me here, but then what? <laughs> Anybody who comes in to buy or sell a plane that's got an interesting story, we uh, might trap them in here and see if we can get a little bit of info out of them. Good, good. Yeah. Um, I encourage Mark to start the YouTube channel because he's just got such a wealth of information. It's so much fun just to come over here, have a drink of coffee, and talk about airplanes, specifically Cessna 180s and 185s because of, you inherited the thing from Stancil, oh, yeah. and Stancil was the guru. Or and on that is. subject, yeah. Joe might be here next week, and I'm trying to talk him into doing a... Bam, get bam, him bam. in here. Yeah, yeah get yeah. him in here. You got to see this guy, Joe Stancil, man. He, Joe makes me look like a dunce. Yeah. <laughs> what was that bet that you guys had? You had some bet that went on for yeah, a really okay. long time. <clears throat> so how Joe got me to know the things I know is he'd see a plane at 100 yards and go, from here... What model and year? And I go, what window is it? Because some years are the same as another year. Mm -hmm. And you go, that's a single year model. And I say, and you can tell what it is from it? Yes. Okay. So I'm looking at it. Three side windows, landing light in the wing. Oh, it's got the cowling on it. The air frontal's in the front. Uh, 74. No, 100 bucks. So I owe him 100 bucks. <laughs> and, we, and we went downhill until I owed him 1,000 bucks. <laughs> And then I started learning it back and getting them right. Paint schemes, landing light positions, gear position, you know, all this stuff. And then I'd be like 900 bucks. And it got back 300, 100. And then when it got to zero, it goes, you're educated. Wait a minute. He cut off the thing there. You couldn't <laughs> win any money back from him. He yeah. just stopped we, the game. We, we did it on, but the, but the education was complete. Wow. But that is how it happened. Now, how long did that process take? 14 years. <laughs> See, that's a lot of information. <laughs> A lot, a lot of information, details, incredible mm. amount of details on these things. And like you say, in a way, the 185s are kind of built like Harleys. Each one is a little bit different coming out of the factory. They're not. Well, and everybody modifies the hell out of them. Yeah. And it's yeah. getting harder and harder to find a stock plane, an original untouched float kit, never on floats, undamaged, complete logs, never been Alaska. I mean, where is that plane now? So, now... <laughs> I don't know if you're going to interview me, but I'm going to interview you. A bit what's of each. Go yeah. <laughs> what's going on in the stock market? Uh, the stock market, the airplane market right now today. Uh, I see on um, in the market there appears to be a lot of Cessna 180s and 185s on the market, which we haven't seen in recent years. Well, the ever what I always tell people is it's an ever diminishing resource. There's like 4,400 185s were built, and there's like 2,200 left. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's the, every day there's one less for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And there's more and more people that want them. And remember what happened to beavers? You could buy a beaver for five grand. Now mm -hmm. they're 350,000. So it's a sort of, the market does this. It goes up, down, up, down, up, mm -hmm. down with oil crises and wars and economies and changes of government, up and down, up and down. But the trend is up. And the, the 185s in particular were massively overpriced for a while where people were making a, a 400 grand plane is actually being asked 600. And when was this, like during the COVID In thing? In COVID, yeah. Mm -hmm. So at 600, it sells for 400, but nobody knows that. And they go, wow, that's sold. That means mine's worth that much too. So there is a constant behind the scenes, and people are seeing prices come down, but they're not. They're actually settling at what they should be at. Right, a return to normal. Yeah. Um, what about this thing where we're getting a lot of new folks in the market and they don't really know the value of these things? So they see it's 600 grand. Well, that well, must be the. If, if you're not a pilot and you want to buy a plane and you just open trade a plane and there are the prices, that, that's their normal. Hmm. So, but it is an ever dwindling supply and one day there'll be one left. <laughs> now, what about the uh, pilot supply? You had a, some interesting comments on that. The people that are current qualified and capable of owning something like a Cessna 180 or 185, a big tail dragger. Is that marketplace shrinking a bit? It's always been a small, I always say, imagine if you had 100 people lined up. Mm -hmm. You said to them, everybody who can fly a tail dragger, step forward. Seven or eight would. Mm -hmm. You go, okay, have you seven or eight? Everybody can fly a 180, 185, step forward. Two would. Mm. So that's why I sell Moonies and Pipers and Beaches as well as those Skywagons. Otherwise, I'd be appealing to a tiny market. So I've expanded into it. But there's not. I mean, it, you only need one buyer per mm -hmm. plane. Mm -hmm. And but some of those buyers are folks with no experience. 
Oh, I know. Oh, boy. I know. Well, then they have to have, they've got some challenges ahead. One of the big ones being insurance. Yeah. yeah. It's like, so how many hours have you got in type? None. What's the plane? A 400 grand, 185? Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah, okay, well, we'll insure it, but it's going to cost nine grand for the first year until you get time and type. Yep, yeah, yeah, and that's what's, I think, driving some of these sales. Uh, some of the old-timers I've talked to is insurance costs are driving them out of aircraft ownership uh, yeah. as they age out and yeah. the insurance prices. And then they buy, they come out of their 182RG into a 182 fixed gear or a Piper Arch or something to get mm. the cheaper. Mm-hmm. But you came here today in a tail dragger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the husky. husky's doing we good. We did a video on that mm -hmm. husky. Remember that? Yeah, 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 yeah. We want to do a video on your 310, too. Yeah, the 1959 310. I'm not an expert on all the different year makes and models, but I can show you around the Harvey. Show me around that one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're also, I mean, everybody knows Blanco Lario. So <laughs> one's YouTube channel is called Blanco Lario, and it's massive. How many subscribers have you got? Uh, we finally have slow... Uh, rise across the 400,000 mark. So we're like at 425,000. And what we're at? We're at like 27? 30,000. 30, yeah. Really? Well, that's good. That's Coming up. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Um, but Blanco Lirio, mm -hmm. people say to me, what does it mean? <laughs> that's one of the first most often asked questions. I got into YouTubing just as a goofing around and then as a hobby, motorcycles, that sort of thing. And then uh, I... Th and so... And working for the airlines, I figured I would just remain anonymous. I'll just use my Jenny's YouTube account. And Your wife's? My Jenny. And my yeah. Jenny, yeah, she's from uh, Spain. And she just made up this name, Blanco Lirio. Blanco Lirio. <laughs> Blanco Lirio. I like your accent on it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Close enough. Translate for my people. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Separated by a common language. Yeah. Um, and so it's her channel. It's uh, uh, She came up with the name of it, uh, Blanco Lirio, White Lily. It's just something she just made up. Yeah, uh, and it works. <laughs> and now it's too late to change it. I didn't know how to... Once the thing took off, I, oh, man, what about this title? And But what made you suddenly think, I want to do you know accident investigation uh, videos? How did I back kind of backdoored into that so it was the whole um the thing that put the channel on the map was the oroville disaster i that suddenly switched the channel from just being a hobby to uh, becoming a going concern um so 20, what, what happened then what was 2017 that? the spillway at oroville oh, yeah. failed and so i took my little my motorcycle knowledge of a gopro camera and uh from the motorcycle and just held it out Took the old mighty Luscombe at the time over the top of uh, Oroville right as the situation happened before the TFR went up and f videoed the whole thing with this handheld GoPro out of the airplane. Brought it home, did a little voice over the top of that video, put it out there, and that video went viral. I mean, it went to a half a million views real quick with thousands of comments and questions and and it was the first time anybody had ever showed exactly what's going on at Orville with some knowledge of the the structure there at Orville. So all of a sudden I realized I've I got to go back there and keep reporting on this. And then it turned into a giant emergency, a very scary uh, uh, evacuation. Um, and so it became a job just reporting on this emergency as it was happening. But how did you then think, let's... I mean, what's the next dam that's going to blow? I mean, yeah, right. So what, am I going to be in the dam business the whole time? Well, it turned out that I got the trust of the folks from DWR and Kiewit Engineering that were re rebuilding the place. So it was a two-year job covering the rebuild, the amazing uh, engineering feat of this 10-year rebuild of the dam. It was 10, it was, I'm sorry, two years. It was two years of a rebuild. It was 10 years worth of work accomplished in two years between seasons. They had to keep have some way of releasing water if they needed to in the meantime uh just fascinating story um and then it, but what made it because you're an airline pilot right so they the folks started asking a whole lot of questions about the mighty lost gum and then they found out wait you're an airline pilot and you're talking about dams <laughs> and so <laughs> then uh, so they, they had a lot of questions about that um and then an accident would happen and folks would start wanting answers so they'd ask you. ask in the comment section specifically what's happening here what's up with that so i reluctantly initially reluctantly got into doing aviation and i didn't want to get into aviation initially because i knew that if i get into aviation i'd have to do it exactly 100 percent correct or i'll just be run out on a rail right. in the aviation community um because th there's a lot of exact specifics oh man yeah um 
so so do you get, do you get a lot of like challenges on, uh, on opinions? yeah oh i'll make a lot of mistakes and that's oh man that's one thing i had to get over fortunately i had my chops kind of worked out with the oroville experience of how to present this stuff and then how to uh correct mistakes i guess you'd say in the next video or mm. or acknowledge them but um uh and then I was reluctant to get into it because of my job. I thought, oh, man, I could lose my job if and you, they you, don't like this. Can you say who you fly for? I still don't say who I fly for. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> It's just a big plane with big engines. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Most folks kind of figure it out. I mean, yeah. I'm on the L.A. to Sydney run and L.A. to London <laughs> run, so that kind of narrows it down. But, um, but I always leave the employer out of it, and I've only gotten one, one call. Yeah, from my employer, I've only had one call to request to take a video down it was about training i gave him a pretty detailed report right. about uh, the training we go through mm. uh, as in, in our annual recurrent training on the boeing 777 uh and then i got in trouble once with southwest airlines and that was really dumb and and i and i did need to take that down and apologize so we had to take one down uh, oh really on a, a firefighting helicopter here we interviewed the owner the, the oh, pilot and yeah. uh he just said yeah go ahead and then they called and they said they really don't want that up there the company yeah 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 he didn't, <clears throat> you got to get permission from we the didn't company. fly it we just had a look around and a talk mm -hmm. but you got to be accurate mm -hmm. and you got to make sure you're not stepping on any toes yep make sure it's okay with the company if you're showing a company plane and that's why i don't show any uniform or any no uh, but sometimes in a departure lounge with scruffy hair straight on jet lag, you'll come up with a... <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to sanitize my uniform so I'm not... <laughs> yeah. But you, you also fly tell. recreationally. So how many hours a month? How many, uh, how many days a month do you fly commercially and how many days a month do you fly the little stuff? <laughs> okay, so uh, at, I've just turned 61. I'm kind of backing off on the airline flying and I'm able to drop a lot of trips nowadays. So I'm down t to maybe... 30 to 60 hours a month of airline flying time and a full schedule at the airlines would be about 80 to 90 hours per month so in the wide body world that would be about three trips like two sydneys and a london that'd be a full month's worth of flying um so if you're only doing one or two of those that's 30 or so hours a month so that gives you a lot of free time those those hours you can get done those three trips i just mentioned uh you can get done in one two three four five six about nine days nine days worth of work so you got the rest of the month off gosh just like here yeah <laughs> that's right every day's a holiday over here we? Yeah. <laughs> you can do so, the to, phone. so to get over your airline flying you fly the husky right so you got a little jet lag that first day when you get back and you don't want to mess with anything but after day two or three you're about ready to go flying again the civilian aviation thing, that's just what I grew up with. That's how I got into aviation. I grew up as a kid at the airport washing airplanes in exchange for airplane rides and learning how to fly. And I'm at the same airport doing the same thing I was doing when I was 15, 16 years old is that, riding dirt bikes and flying how, airplanes. Is that how it started? Yeah, and yeah. You got into flying. Right. So uh, uh, Dad had the idea of becoming a uh, gentleman Christmas tree farmer and oh. retired from the aerospace industry out of uh, Aerojet down in... Uh, Orangevale, Carmichael, Orangevale, um, Rancho Cordova area, and we moved up here to Grass Valley. So Dad retired early to be this gentleman Christmas tree farmer. I was the indentured servant on the Christmas tree farm. Aged. <laughs> Aged. Well, I was about eight years old when we oh, got going. Okay. <laughs> Better than cleaning chimneys yeah. like me when I was in England. Yeah, oh, yeah, you're going to be a sweep. <laughs> Where's your hat? Send your kid off, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so pruning Christmas trees out there in the field, we were located right on the downwind for Grass Valley Airport. Mm. So right near the airport. Dad always had us into model airplanes as kids, so we were deep into aviation. But he aviation. didn't fly. But he didn't fly. No, right. no. He kind of missed the war. He was going to start the pilot training program and the T-craft for the military, but the war wrapped up too quick. and mm. So he became an aerospace engineer instead. Um... And so with that deep interest in aviation and seeing all these airplanes flying overhead all the time, we just drop our tools, get on our little bicycles and pedal on up to Nevada County Airport and yeah. find something more interesting to do than That's it, If Christmas you really trees. love flying, you do find yourself as a kid hanging around airports, mm -hmm. washing planes. You can't just do it because I sell a lot of planes to people who, when they're not airlining, they're at home. And when they retire, 
they never fly again. They go, I don't want to fly. Well, wait a minute. How can you sell my plane if that's no, no, their no, case? No, no. People are who I know. Oh, say, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I don't want to fly. You know, like an mm -hmm. airline pilot. And they go, I don't want to fly a small plane. One engine. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. Once you get do... into that professional uh, level of flying, you look back and go, holy smokes, that's just way too uh, sketchy. I'm not doing that. I sold a, um, a 206 to a 777 captain, mm -hmm. Continental, no names. And um, he said, okay, uh, one question. What? What is manifold pressure again? And I was like, "What?" And he goes, yeah, "It's been a while." <laughs> yeah. I sit about 400 yards away from my engines, and I have other people doing things. Yeah. I, like, I said, "Okay, well, blah blah." I told him what it did. He goes, "And so, how do you get to Vegas from here?" I said, "Over the Sierras." <laughs> and he goes, "Which airway?" I went, "No, just go over the Sierras <laughs> until Vegas appears, and then land it." He goes, "Not on an airway." And I went, "No." He goes, "Come with me." I went with him, and he put me on an airliner home the next day. Because he didn't, because that was him getting back into GA when he wow, retired. That's a major, major step. So there you are again. You might have thousands of hours as an airline pilot, but you step back into GA, you are in that 300 hour danger zone all over again. You are a absolute rookie. You don't know what you don't know, or you've forgotten what you knew about general aviation so yeah. many years ago. And when you get back in it, you land at 50 feet at 120 <laughs> rather than the way a Cessna should land. <laughs> That's yeah. right, yeah. If you're in the wide bodies, yeah, you're yeah. way off the ground. So, yeah, that's a big transition, and that's... And so, at work, I see a lot of <clears throat> airline pilots that are super into general aviation, and we'll have a lot to talk about on our on our three- and four-day trip, and then many others that are just like you say, they're not, not interested. Not in their, when I learned to fly here in 91 in Fullerton in L.A. in my 150, and I went home from to America, to England from America with 41 hours... It was pre-9-11, and I, went, I, I said to the flight attendant, can I go to the cockpit? It was Virgin. And they went, yeah. So I went up to the cockpit, and there's two pilots there, sort of bored, stiff, drinking a cup of coffee, looking out the window. Everything's autopilot. Yeah. And the co-pilot looked across at the pilot and went, passenger, and both grabbed the yokes <laughs> and looked out the window. <laughs> you, you know, we're over the Atlantic at 40,000 feet. <laughs> to pretend. And then they, la you know, then they laughed. But he said, do you want to know what my real passion is? And the pilot whipped out a picture of a long easy. Oh, good. That he had mm -hmm. in England. Yeah. Because that's why I love to fly. Ah, see. I said, oh, yeah, you know. He was into GA then. Yeah. Good, good, yeah. Yeah, I remember pre-9-11, uh, my young daughter at the time came up to the cockpit when we were flying, and just, it's nighttime, and she's just looking around horrified, and there's this <laughs> ghost ship just flying itself while we're just sitting there. And she said, D -d Dad, who's flying the airplane? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially if you walk down the aisle through first class. Hello, hello, hello. We go, isn't somebody supposed to be up front? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's third and fourth pilot thing, too. You but if you were up. going to Sydney, mm -hmm. how much of it is just sitting there? All of it. Freaking near all of it. It's a uh, 15 to 16 hour flight. You will hand fly, typically hand fly the aircraft. You take off, hand fly the plane. It could be as little as 1,000 feet or maybe as high as 10,000 feet, 12,000 feet before you turn the autopilot back on or turn it on. And so it's just a matter of minutes. You're hand flying that departure, autopilot on, 15 hours or so, and... <laughs> When it comes Auto to, land. Well, you can, but um, <laughs> we do normally hand fly the landing, but we get so tired and, dare I say, lazy that we'll, my technique is just to do it all on autopilot until we're fully configured and on the glide slope and then kick the autopilot off and, and land. So you log 15 hours but fly 25 minutes? Yeah, of hand flying. That's it. Yeah, so your your flying skills can definitely deteriorate before your very eyes, and that's one of the reasons I enjoy still flying general aviation right. aircraft. It keeps your flying chops up. Um, exactly. I mean, it's like Sully with the Hudson. Mm -hmm. He was a military GA. He's hands-on pilot. That's mm -hmm. why he put it in the river and made it. Yeah, made such a perfectly smooth and wings level yeah. landing there into the Hudson. Yeah. Was he a glider pilot? Also, I've heard rumor uh, about I'm not that. Not sure. Yeah. But it, uh, well, he, he is now, I guess. Yeah, yeah, he is. <laughs> if he'd turned back, he probably wouldn't have made it. Right, right. We've all seen the movie. Uh, you know, I just did a video about uh, uh, that, that uh, the caravan. Did you see the caravan um, stuff it in the road the other day there, mm -hmm. taking off out of Washington, Dallas? And so I tried it in MS 2020, uh, oh. just for fun in the simulator, and 
I wrecked. <laughs> so I just put that in the video and I said, here, I'm going to try it. And uh, I didn't make it. That crew did. So. I can't fly those simulators. You know what it's like? Yeah. With a stick or a yoke or the feel of the plane, it'd be mm -hmm. better. But you know, in a real plane, you look out to the left to see what thing. You can't. It's just a screen. Well, you gotta, I guess we got to get our VR goggles and yeah, all this yeah, stuff, know, uh, yeah. getting all kinds of suggestions on how to improve that. <laughs> And that's the case with Sully is they, they, he started getting all that grief about why didn't you turn back and they tried it in the simulator. Well, it took them dozens of tries in the simulator before somebody could successfully make it back to the airport. Right. So easier yeah. said than done. So um, we're about 20 minutes. We try not to go over that without boring people, but um, we just thought we'd start wrapping it up now. I always figured we could be here all day at this. I can't believe it's been 20 minutes already. All right. No editing needed. <laughs> so um, this is podcast number three, and we've got one Brown here who very kindly came in, and he's got his own channel, which is really worth watching. It's huge, Blanco Lirio on YouTube. Um, this is Skywagon's podcast, but we have another channel, uh, Skywagon University, that this is on, but it's also a lot of information about planes, types, models, years, differences, and all the stuff that a lot of people don't know about. So if you liked it, Click on subscribe, press the bell, and you'll get notifications of new ones, of which there will be many. And don't worry, we haven't gone to podcast only. There's going to still be the normal plane videos as they come in. But thanks, um, Juan, for coming in. That was Sure, and thanks for getting the Skywagons University up and running and keeping us all posted on all the latest changes and modifications and things you need to know about buying a Cessna 180 or 185 or any of the thing yeah. in the used aircraft market. Yeah, thanks for pushing me through that. Do you remember the outtakes we did at the beginning where I couldn't get it right? Yeah. Camera shy. And a, that's, if you want to watch an amusing one, there's one where we're doing like outtakes. He's a natural now. Yeah, maybe. Well, thanks very much. All right. See you here. Okay.